Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Byron Community Church. Thank you for joining us here on YouTube today. A couple of announcements before we get to Pastor John's sermon today. As we mentioned last week, our annual general meeting is coming up. It is scheduled for May 12th at 730. Of course, this will be done virtually on Zoom. So in this last week or so, the office has sent out all of the reports and the financial information. If you did not get that email, if you did not get that information, please connect with the church office. The Zoom link is going to be sent out as we get closer to May 12th. But before our AGM, we have a very exciting virtual event. I know we're all stuck indoors, we're all stuck at home. So why not join us here on YouTube as we bake along. We're going to sing a couple of songs. We're going to share some favorite recipes. And we're going to be joined by the Donut Man. The Donut Man is one of the most famous, most successful children evangelists of all time. He has traveled all around the world sharing songs and stories about Jesus. He sold over 6 million CDs. He's going to be joining us for our Bake Along. We've got a local paramedic. We've got Chef Ronnie Burns. We've got some of our youth group members. We're going to be invited into their homes virtually, and we're going to share some of our favorite recipes together. You will not want to miss it. It is on demand, available Saturday, May 8th. And now, Pastor John is going to continue his series today with a sermon entitled, How to Treat a Friend. Over to you, John. It's a great challenge. It's a tantalizing task. It can be even an awesome or an awful adventure. It's purchasing an appropriate card, like a birthday card, for a friend. Now, I don't know who writes the script for these cards or who comes up with the concept for these cards, but so many are uh, actually kind of silly. Uh, others are borderline offensive. Still others are, how do I put it, sappy. Uh, recently, it took me 15 minutes to select an appropriate card for a, a friend. In fact, in the past, I've even bought two cards to give to a friend, uh, one that's kind of funny and the other that might be more serious. Uh, it's expensive, but I'm trying to cover my tracks. Now, added to this challenge, uh, added to the difficulty of selecting an appropriate card, are some of the dynamics of friendship that we considered last week when we introduced this idea of friendship in our section in Philippians. Uh, you know, there's not just a one-size-fits-all. No two friendships you have are exactly the same. You might have a friend who is a good friend but you have another person who is a close friend, maybe even your best friend. Uh, you, may have, uh, you may have a friend who is in your outer circle of friendships, but then you have another person, this is an uh, inner circle friend. And then key distinctions are in the area uh, of... Uh, having a friend who is kind of like a long-term friend. Uh, she's been with you, uh, been there for you, and there with you for all the seasons of life, the winter, spring, summer, or fall kind of friend. But you might have another friend, and uh, this friend has been there for you in a particular season of life, has connected with you uh, during a a specific period of your life. Last weekend, I uh, was uh, attending a, a Zoom conference, and up on the screen popped uh, three people from my past. One of them was Jay. Some of you know Jay. Uh, when Jay was here in London, we would often have uh, breakfast together. Uh, he now lives out in Alberta, and we don't have near as much contact. 
the other fellow on the screen, one of the other fellows, was, was uh, Gary. Uh, Gary once pastored here in London, and we would often have lunch together. And uh, now Gary is ministering elsewhere in Ontario, and we're not in touch as much as we were. And you're thinking there's a theme here. I've got a, a breakfast friend and a lunch friend who's my dinner friend. But, but the other fellow who showed up on the screen was, was Ross. Ross was a good buddy of mine back in seminary. We did a lot of stuff together. But over time, we've gone separate ways. And Ross now is a pastor out in Halifax. Uh, all three men have had impact in my life, but for a particular season of life. Now, last week, we looked at Timothy. Timothy was there for the long haul in Paul's life. Uh, Timothy was a close friend of Paul's. We even dared to say last weekend that Timothy may have been Paul's best friend. But today we're going to encounter another friend of Paul's. The Apostle Paul had a friend named Epaphroditus. That's right, Epaphroditus. No, that's not some ancient disease nor is Epaphroditus an exotic name for a flower. Uh, it was a common name back in the Greco-Roman culture, Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus was not Paul's best friend, but he was a friend who had influence and impact in Paul's life for a particular season of his life. It was a short-term friendship that was very significant. Paul valued his friendship with Epaphroditus, and it's a friendship that's worthy of recognition and demands our attention as we continue to consider Paul's ministry and his friendship, uh, his friendships with people like the Philippians, Timothy, and today, Epaphroditus. Now, I guess you could say this is kind of like friendship part two. Last week, as I indicated, we looked at Paul and Timothy, but we gave that uh, message in the context of Paul's relationship with the Philippians. Do you remember we looked at three metaphor, metaphors, two that applied to Paul and the Philippians, one that applied to Paul and Timothy? Do you remember them? The relay race and the drink offering, referring to Paul and the Philippians' friendship. And then we looked at Paul and Timothy with this metaphor of like a father to his son. And then we saw that there were three characteristics uh, in Timothy that uh, shows us uh, what a good friend looks like. We talked about, do you remember the three characteristics? There was his compatibility with Paul, his humility, and then we looked at Timothy's reliability. In all this, we were asking uh, two big questions that we strive to answer. What kind of friend do you need? And then we asked, what kind of friend do you need to be? Now, we could continue that approach or pattern with Paul and Epaphroditus. But as I said, it's a different kind of friendship, and I thought it might be good for us to look at this friendship from another angle or from another perspective. I suppose we could ask the question, how do you cultivate a friendship with someone like Epaphroditus? Uh, how do you help a friend? But today's focus is going to be looking at friendship from our side, from your side, from my side of the equation. The question is, how do you treat a friend? Did you get that? How should you treat a friend? Now, don't forget the setting for this last section in Philippians chapter 2. We know that Paul has been imprisoned in Rome. He's awaiting his fate. Will he be executed or will he be acquitted? Paul is under a great amount of stress. This is a very distressful uh, situation for Paul, 
and yet he is still able to celebrate his joy in Christ. What he does want to do is when the outcome uh, becomes official, if he's acquitted, Paul himself would like to visit Philippi again. In the meantime, uh, he is planning to send Timothy to visit Philippi. Timothy, who was so compatible with Paul, who would represent uh, Paul's pastoral concerns uh, for the Philippians that are outlined especially in Philippians chapter 2. Now with Epaphroditus, he's already on his way to Philippi when Paul uh, writes this epistle. I, actually, I believe that uh, Epap Epaphroditus would likely ac actually be delivering this epistle to the Philippians. But there was a reason, some urgency for Epaphroditus, who was from Philippi, who came to Rome for a purpose. Th there was a, a reason for Paul finding it necessary to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi. So with that context, I'd like us to read Philippians chapter 2. We'll, we'll pick up from uh, where we left off last week in verse 23-24, and then our main passage today, chapter 2, verse 25, to the end of this chapter in Philippians. So Paul writes, I hope, therefore, to send Timothy as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Paul is uh, figuring that he will be acquitted. Now he writes in verse 25, But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you, and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, and he almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, Welcome him, in, in, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. The Lord will bless uh, the reading of his word. Now, before we look at three ways to treat a friend, as seen in Paul's relationship with Epaphroditus. Uh, a little more background. There, among scholars, is what I call uh, areas of consensus with this passage, areas of agreement. Uh, everyone agrees that uh, Epaphroditus was a, a friend of Paul's, that Epaphroditus came from Philippi and he had an assignment as he traveled to, to Rome, and that was to present uh, the Apostle Paul with a financial gift, a significant financial gift from the Philippians. Uh, this would look after Paul's lodging and his food. Even as a prisoner, he was responsible for paying for these services. There is also an agreement that uh, uh, Epaphroditus uh, ended up sick. Was it on the way to Rome or was it while he was staying in Rome? Uh, we don't know that, but we do know uh, and can agree that Epaphrodi Epaphroditus uh, became quite ill. Uh, we also know, it's clear in the text, that Paul determined it was necessary to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi. Now we have what I call conflicting views. The first area of conflicting view has to do whether this was a singular or a double mission. A singular mission would be that Epaphroditus' purpose was to drop the gift off to Paul in Rome and then immediately go back to Philippi. The double mission view is that not only 
was uh, Epaphroditus delivering the gift to Paul. Uh, keep in mind back then there was no UPS. There was no opportunity to do a bank transaction. It would have to be an in-person delivery. So the idea was that not only was Paul uh, Epaphroditus doing that, but he also, it was planned that he would stay for a while and minister to the needs of Paul, whether that be for a month or three months or six months. Uh, we're not sure of that. Now, I, I lean towards that double mission point of view, that Epaphroditus for that season came to deliver a financial gift and to stay for a while, a while later, to minister to Paul's needs. But another area where there's disagreement is on why did Paul send Epaphroditus back to Philippi? Now, it seems very obvious that Epaphroditus was concerned because the Philippians were concerned about him. They had heard that he was sick. They didn't know how sick he was, and uh, Epaphroditus didn't want to worry them too much. There's question of, uh, was he oversensitive in terms of that concern? Should he have been more concerned about Paul or more concerned about the Philippians? And then there's a prickly issue. Was uh, Epaphroditus suffering from a little bit of homesickness, this longing to return, to leave Rome and go back home to Philippi? These are all hard questions. But don't forget our core concern, and that's this question, how should you treat a friend? So when I look at the text, as I've indicated, I see three ways by which we should treat a friend. Here's the first one. Affirm your friend's strengths. Let me repeat it. Affirm your friend's strengths strengths. As I've already mentioned, Epaphroditus was from Philippi. Uh, his name is interesting, named after the Greek goddess of love and sex, a very secular name. No question that Epaphroditus was a Greek man and was a Gentile. Uh, look at that when you think of Paul, who was a uh, quite a Jewish man and, 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 and at one point had reveled in his Jewishness. So there you have this uh, unique friendship between a, uh, a Gentile and a Jew. Epaphroditus was definitely a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. Uh, there's no record of him having any official titles, uh, no record of him being a great preacher. There are no epistles named after him. In fact, we only find Epaphroditus mentioned here in Philippians 2 and later in uh, Philippians chapter 4. But while he was behind the scenes, don't underestimate Epaphroditus. He had quite an impact on Paul and others. In fact, Paul affirms his strengths in verse 25. He has this five-fold description of Epaphroditus. He describes Epaphroditus first as my brother. That's a very significant designation. He is my brother. Yes, Paul said, I'm Jewish, and uh, Epaphroditus has a Gentile background, but we have a bond in Christ that far surpasses our ethnic origins. We are brothers in Christ. We have this bond in him. We have the same Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. We share the same Holy Spirit in our inner being. We are brothers. And Paul, by extension, would say of others, uh, brothers and, sister, and sisters in Christ. Uh, let's not... Uh, gloss over how important it is to regard one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, especially when we think of the church as a fellowship of friends. And then Paul says of Epaphroditus, he is a co-worker. 
Do you remember last week we talked about the importance of friends being drawn to a cause, a common cause? And uh, Paul admired those who worked hard, who worked diligently for the cause of Christ. And this described Epaphroditus. They shared that common bond of being co-workers for Christ. And then I love this next term, the third term, a a fellow soldier. Uh, Think of uh, soldiers. Remember last week when we talked about um, the Greco-Roman philosophy around friendship, and I indicated there was a very strong distinction back then between someone who would be a friend and someone who was an enemy. Uh, Paul sure had a lot of enemies, a lot of people who opposed him. And maybe that's why he valued friends so much. But he saw Epaphroditus in terms of spiritual warfare. Paul saying, though I have enemies and there's opposition. Some of it is even spiritual opposition. Paul is saying here, Epaphroditus is my fellow soldier. He, like me, is a soldier of the cross. I mean, think of soldiers. I I think there's a, a special relationship between two soldiers, especially two soldiers who are friends. Uh, back in World War I, there was a lot of trench warfare, and uh, the enemy was bombing the Allies, and uh, there was a fellow, we'll call him Johnny, who was badly injured in one of the trenches. His friend Jimmy said to the commander, I want to go and uh, try to rescue my, my friend in the trench. Uh, the commander said, it, it's not worth it. Your friend is badly injured, and even if you're able to get to him, there's a good chance he's going to die or to, to be dead. Uh, I, I think it's not worth you risking your life to do that. But uh, the friend insisted. He says, I, I need to rescue him. And so he managed to get to the trench, took that friend, threw him over his shoulder, came back to safety, and the commander and others discovered that the friend indeed was dead. The commander said to uh, the fellow, he said, I told you that uh, it wasn't worth it, that your friend would be dead. And the fellow said, oh, it was worth it. When he got, when I got to him, Just before he died, he said to me, I knew you'd come for me. Friend, I knew you'd come for me. A fellow soldier, uh, one of the strongest examples, one of the stronger indicators of friendship. And then Epaphroditus is your messenger. This was an important task. I cannot overstate it. This task of delivering or uh, being the messenger with this financial gift for Paul. The Philippians trusted Epaphroditus. He was one of their own. Uh, A guy who had proven himself, just like Timothy last week, to be someone proven and reliable. Your messenger. And then this last phrase, whom you sent to take care of my need, to minister to my needs. Now, it's interesting. There is a Greek word that's often used that's translated to minister or to serve. It's not the word used here. The word used here for taking care of is actually a a word that conveys a sacred duty, a sacred obligation, a calling to attend to Paul's needs. Do you remember last week I I said that uh, in the Greco-Roman world, friendship was more than something that was casual or informal. It was often seen as a duty or an obligation. And here we see with Epaphroditus, this was a calling. This was a serious task, that of looking after Paul's needs. I wonder if it would help us if we viewed friendship in that way, as as a calling, as a sacred duty, this sense of uh, holy obligation to those 
that God has placed into your life and my life. But again, notice our emphasis, how to treat a friend. And what I like in verse 25 is that Paul was affirming Epaphroditus' strengths. What does this mean to us? Well, this is the starting point. In this day and age, we often focus on someone's flaws or weaknesses. When we get up close and personal with someone, we can't notice but notice their shortcomings. But Paul was intentional. He keyed in on, he capitalized on Epaphroditus' strengths. And this is a good place for you and me to start. When you think of that friend, the starting point should always be in your mind to affirm and to acknowledge that person's strengths. The other important feature here in affirmation is, is identification. Uh, Paul goes out of his way to identify those areas, uh, those aspects of uh, Epaphroditus' life where he is a, a strong friend. Uh, it's, it's like a, uh, an interview where the uh, interviewer asks the person, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Here, we are invited to do that with another, with, with a friend. Make a point of being able to identify what are the strengths that that person possesses. I've had some fun with this this past week where I've been thinking of some friends in my life and I've been intentional and deliberate in identifying their strengths. Now, the final step I think is critical, and that is to communicate to communicate that even to the friend. Uh, let's be mindful that Epaphroditus, as the one who would have been delivering this epistle to the Philippians, uh, would at some point become aware of what Paul was saying about him. Uh, it's important that we take opportunity. As awkward or difficult as it might be, we need to take opportunity to tell a friend, hey, this is what I appreciate about you. This is where I see you as being very strong. What a way to support and encourage that person. And of course, with communication comes the responsibility to communicate to others, to give them a sense of what it is you appreciate, uh, what it is you acknowledge as a strength in that person's life. In a time and day where we often focus on a person's failures or a person's negative qualities, we need to use this as our starting point. Paul affirmed the strengths of Epaphroditus. You need to affirm, you need to acknowledge the strengths of your friends. Now this uh, second point to me is very important. I need to navigate it carefully. For if one way we treat a friend is to affirm his strength, the second step or second way we treat a friend is to protect your friend in weakness or in a distressing situation. I, I'd be even more specific. To protect or defend your friend in his or her weaknesses, and to protect your friend, to defend that person uh, in stressful situations, of, uh, in those times of distress. This situation described at the end of chapter 2 was not ideal. This was not the way things were planned. Epaphroditus got sick. Now, make no mistake, sickness was not his fault. Nor do I think it overly helpful to regard strengths as only positive and weaknesses as only negative. But I think you'll agree with me, this made the situation hard and difficult for Epaphroditus and for Paul. I believe the intention was for Epaphroditus to be there for a long while with Paul, 
but he got very sick. And uh, what I appreciate, though, is that Paul doesn't throw Epaphroditus under the bus. Paul could have said, hey, Philippians, why did you send somebody to me who was sick, who was going to get sick? This has really made the situation hard for me. I needed someone young and healthy and vibrant, and now I've got this sick guy that I've had to nurse back to health. Uh, No, Paul didn't go there. Uh, He, in fact, confirms that Epaphroditus was sick. They had heard rumor that he was sick. Paul is saying, hey, you need to know, indeed, he was very sick. Just in case you think he might have exaggerated it or how sick was he, uh, he was very sick, even to the point of death. Now, of course, the controversial matter. We read in verses 26 to 28 that Epaphroditus was longing to go back to Philippi. Was this longing only because he was concerned, because the Philippians were concerned about him, or was there a tinge of homesickness where Epaphroditus had this longing? In fact, he was distressed. That's a strong word. He was in mental anguish. He was in emotional turmoil over his desire to go back to uh, Philippi. Homesickness is always a tricky one. Uh, I remember when I was pastoring in Toronto, we would often have students from north of Toronto, uh, especially from the Bancroft area, and it seemed like any weekend they could, they were heading home to Bancroft. And for some of us, we thought, it would be nice if they kind of stayed around in Toronto and didn't feel they always had to go back to Bancroft. Maybe there was a tinge of uh, homesickness there. When I worked in Halliburton, I'd have people say to me, why do you go back to Toronto as frequently as you go back? Well, I like going back to Toronto, family there, close friends there, but people will always question uh, one's motivation in this kind of area. Maybe there was a blend uh, between uh, Epaphroditus' concern for the Philippians and uh, his that element of homesickness. What is important to us is how Paul responded to it. He didn't say, oh, you know, Epaphroditus, what a a wimp. He's way too oversensitive about your concerns for him. He should be staying here and looking after me. Nor did Paul make light of Epaphroditus' turmoil or distress. Uh, Paul was amazingly supportive. As I read through these verses, as Paul talks about God's mercy on Epaphroditus and healing him and even the mercy that was extended to Paul, Paul analyzed uh, the situation uh, from that perspective. Uh, Paul was saying, if it comes down to the concerns of you Philippians or my concerns, uh, your concerns take a higher place. Uh, When it came to Paul's distress about the situation he was in and the distress that Epaphroditus was experiencing, Paul said, no, Epaphroditus, it's, it's necessary. I'm prepared to send you back for your good and for the good of the Philippians. I see some progress. I say this carefully in Paul's experience. Do you remember Paul with uh, John Mark. Uh, John Mark abandoned uh, Paul's mission team. and Paul was pretty upset about it. Uh, Paul's friend Barnabas said to uh, Paul, we need to give John Mark another chance. He wants to rejoin us. And that led to a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Eventually, because of Barnabas, John John Mark returned and was very effective even in supporting Paul. So maybe there's some progress and development. Maybe Paul has even mellowed a bit in this sense of appreciating and understanding where Epaphroditus was coming from. The key point here in this section is seeing how Paul protected and defended Epaphroditus in this situation of weakness in what was a distressing situation. What does this mean to us? Well, 
let me just park on this with you for a few minutes. Uh, how important is that we take this kind of approach with friends in their time of weakness? I, I would argue it's a real test of a friendship. A friendship, a friend is there when times are good for you, but is especially there when you're going through some of these rough periods, whether it's uh, physical distress or emotional or mental distress. You know, there are friends who will say to you when you're in a time of weakness, I've got your back. You'll find a couple of people here and there who will stab you in the back. In fact, I remember years ago, someone giving me this advice. I'm sure they thought it was wise advice. Be careful not to let others see your weaknesses or any areas of vulnerability because they'll take advantage of it. Now that may have been wise advice, but very sad advice to think that there are people who will do it. And we need to take a higher road. You and me, you need to be that kind of friend. I need to be that kind of friend who will protect and defend that friend in his or her weakness or in her, his or her time of distress. It was very difficult when my sister lost her husband to a very tragic accident. My sister had a couple of close friends who rallied around her. When, when Pam would go to church, she called them her huddle. They would protect her because some people had inappropriate questions they wanted to ask her, comments that weren't really that helpful. So this holy huddle, their, their job was to protect her, to defend her, to filter some of those who wanted to come her way. That's a very important role for us. I think of a, a situation years ago uh, a friend, Will, who was a professor of mine, his daughter got very sick. And because of that, Will had to miss a few classes. And uh, it, in some ways, compromised uh, our course. But I do remember a couple of students being quite upset about it, complaining about it, even gossiping about it. Is it as bad as he says it is? Should we be missing these classes? Back then I had a choice. The choice was, do I join in and do I pile on or do I take the high road and defend and protect my friend? I chose to defend and protect Will and I'm very glad for it. Because the reality is, sooner than later, you may find yourself in a situation of weakness or in a distressing situation or circumstance. Here's something else somebody told me years ago. Treat other people the way you would like to be treated. In a time of weakness, like sickness or financial difficulty, you need people who will protect you who will defend you, who will support you, who will encourage you. You need people who can be there for you in those distressing situations, who will defend you, who will say to others, he's not a failure, she's not a failure, good will come of this. How should we treat a friend? You need to affirm that friend's strengths. That's the starting point. And you need to protect that friend in his or her weaknesses, in his or her distressing situations. On well, the last two verses, we see our third way to treat a friend. When Paul says, so then, welcome Epaphroditus back in the Lord and with great joy. Uh, this is a bit of an apologetic. I think Paul worried that people would misinterpret Epaphroditus' motives for coming back. They would be whispering, 
Was he really all that sick? Uh, we think he was a failure. He didn't stay for as long as we had planned that he would stay with Paul. So here's Paul saying, Welcome Epaphroditus back to Philippi, not as a zero, but as a hero. Give him a hero's welcome and do it with gladness and with joy. Why? Because he almost died for the work of Christ. Paul recognizes and acknowledges the great sacrifice and the great service uh, that we see uh, in the example of Epaphroditus. Honor him, esteem him, especially for his acts and works of sacrifice and service. He risked his life, and then it says to make up for the help you yourselves were not able to give. Uh, the whole church at Philippi could not travel to Rome with that financial gift. He was Epaphroditus. Maybe he had one or two others join him for part of the trip. But the reality is Epaphroditus was their representative. He was the one who was uh, representing their interests while he delivered that gift to Rome. It's kind of like our missionaries. Maybe you will never have an opportunity to travel to Asia. Most of us have never been to South America. A uh, few of us have been to Africa. But we have missionaries in all those places. I think of when our missionaries come back to Canada for a, a rest or for what's called a furlough. How do we welcome them? Do we give them a hero's welcome? not based on kind of glib assessments of success or failure, but do we recognize the sacrifices and service they've endured for the cause of Christ? We should treat our missionaries triumphantly in this manner. And this is what Paul urges for Epaphroditus. Treat a friend, especially a co-worker friend, with honor and with esteem. What does that mean? Honor is often associated with another word, blessing. What does it mean to bless someone? We've talked about this in the past. There's three main meanings for that word bless in the New Testament. The first case is to eulogize. The word bless comes from that root to eulogize. It's to speak well of. How often we wait and speak well of a friend who's dead. We have these eulogies at a funeral. I think a good notion is to speak well of a friend who might be very much alive. Esteem that person. Honor him through your words and through your actions. Hey, we talked about a birthday card. If it's a birthday time for your friend, send a card that captures that kind of message. It might be a, a letter that you could send that's appropriate. So the idea of speaking well of a second a notion with bless is to thank. To thank God for that friend. How often do you do that? When you are praying to the Lord, making your requests and supplications, do you, do you spend time to thank God for all his blessings, but especially for those friends like the Epaphroditus that he's put placed into your life. So there's to speak well of, to thank, finally, to uh, invoke, to ask God to bestow favor on that friend. I'm sure that's what Paul did for Epaphroditus. Long after Epaphroditus returned to Philippi, to Philippi I'm sure that Paul continued to pray for Epaphroditus, that God would come and bless him mightily. You see, how to treat a friend is a very important thing. Whether it's an inner circle, close friend, best friend, or if it's someone on the outer circle of your friendships, whether it's people here at Byron Community Church in our fellowship of friendship, Let's, with God's help and by his grace, treat 
others really, really well. And we have, as our prime example, Jesus Christ. Look at the way he treats you and me, those he calls his friends, the one who died on the cross for his friends, the one who not only risked his life but gave his life for us. Jesus Christ, this great friend, is our example. He is the one who enables us to treat others well. How should we treat a friend? Affirm his or her strengths, protect, defend that friend in his or her weaknesses or in those times of distress. And finally, let's honor, let's esteem people like Epaphroditus, those people who have influence and impact over us. Let's honor our friends. In Jesus' name, amen.